Alright everyone, so this is the third video I've put up today, and um, I figured that Snakes and Foxes, it's fairly simple, but now we're just throwing you in the deep end. Um, this is Sha Ra. Now, this is a interpretation of what I was able to find online. Um, the story goes that a avid fan tried to decipher how to play the game and took their prototype version to Dragon Con. And at Dragon Con, they found Brandon Sanderson, and according to the story, he explained the rest of the rules to the fan, and the fan then posted the rules to the internet. So um, I apologize, I don't know your name right off. I will cite it in the credits um, for the video of your name, of whoever uh, came up with this and posted it online. But this is Shara, or as a uh, character mentions in the story, the true game. Um, so Shara is essentially super chess. So I'm going to use chess terms to try to um, teach this to people because uh, it's much simpler that way. And we will go on. Now the balls here are specifically to put pieces in if they are claimed. That's it. So the bowls serve no purpose outside of being an aesthetic. You have this board that has a giant perimeter of red and green checkered squares. Now my objective, if I was the green player, is to get this piece right here, the Fisher King, into a green square. And my opponent's objective is to get the Fisher King into a red square. So we're going to go over the basics of the game and show you kind of how it works. So you're each dealt 33 pieces. These consist of 11 foxes, 11 snakes, and 11 stones. Each piece can move in a certain way and has rules that you have to follow. So the first that we're gonna go over is stones. So a stone piece is represented by this little tower here, and each player has um, 11 of them. A stone is able to move like a king could in chess which means that they can move to any square that is directly adjacent to them or diagonally adjacent to them. Now, a stone cannot be used under any circumstances to take a piece on the board. So even if this was the case, you could not take this square with the green or the red stone and move these into the bowl. Um, they would kind of just be stuck staring at each other. So a stone has the one characteristic in this game that is, it can threaten, but it cannot take a piece, ever. The second type of piece, uh, are the these two uh, other pieces are in their own category, which is that they are allowed to take pieces off the board. So you have snakes, which a snake you have to interpret as a bishop. So a snake can move any amount of spaces diagonally. So they're always going to end up on the same color that they started on. So if they started on black, they're always going to end up on black, but they can go as far as here. Um, I'll mention one more time this outside, or uh, for the first time, and uh, I'll probably have to mention it again, this outside perimeter is not accessible to any pieces on the board except this middle piece called the Kingfisher. So a, st so a stone, a snake, or a fox can only go as far as the perimeter. But a snake is allowed to take pieces. So for instance, if this was like this, this snake could move to here, claiming that snake and taking the spot. Now the next thing is the foxes. Foxes are like rooks. So they're able to move perpendicular and parallel, um, or up and down and side to side as far as they want. And just like snakes, they can take pieces. So that's the discussion of the movement for the main pieces. Now when we get to the Kingfisher. Now the Kingfisher piece is able to move in two different ways. So the first thing is this middle square is both black and white. So that's important to remember. If a Kingfisher is on a white square, they can move as far as they want in any direction, up, down, left, right, diagonal, side to side, doesn't matter. They can go anywhere. So you have to think of them like a queen in chess. But they are not permitted to take pieces, similar to the stones. So in this case, this piece could not move here. 
because it can't actually take the stone piece. But if they are on black squares, they can move only like a king could in chess. So one square in any direction, but they have the added advantage of being able to take pieces and throw them into the bowl, if you don't miss the bowl. So this is referenced in one of the books that uh, the Kingfisher is uh, fleeting and uh, able to run great distances when on the white and powerful and strong while on the black. So this is a reference to that point where the Kingfisher is only able to move one square and they're very slow, but they're able to kill anything surrounding them if they are on the black. So now about how to get this piece here. So the Kingfisher has the objective of, is a mutual objective between both players. Both players are attempting to corral the Kingfisher or essentially threaten it in every direction except for one free area. So in this case, this Kingfisher would be corralled or um, sieged or stolen. So if your opponent has nothing, like say this fox here was here, you couldn't claim the Kingfisher because the fox is here. However, if this fox was here and there was nothing uh, threatening the Kingfisher in this particular square, like for instance a piece like this, then you as the green player would have control of the Kingfisher. Now the rules with the Kingfisher, whenever you have control is, you have the responsibility of moving the Kingfisher every single turn. You can't move it, you can't move any other pieces you have. So you have to move the Kingfisher and you can either use it to try to constantly kill other units that your opponent has, or you would use it to try to escape. Now there's three ways to win the game. The first way is to take control of the Kingfisher, um, as I just did in that example. I'm just moving the pieces off so that it's a little simpler for people to see. So the first way to win is to move the Kingfisher to the perimeter, which that is the rule. You can only go to the perimeter. And after a turn goes by for your opponent, you safely move into your color. And this would be a win for green. Um, the other way to win is for all of your opponent's pieces to end up in the bowl <laughs> or knocked off the table. So if you can manage to take all of your opponent's pieces, even if they have the Kingfisher, you win the game by default. And then the last way to win is to force your opponent to not be able to safely move into their color, but force them to move into, into your color. So as the green player, if I was in control of the Kingfisher and I attempted to move and there was no safe way for me to move in here and no safe location for me to move, because you have to think of the Kingfisher like the king in chess, you can't move it into danger. Um, so if there's no safe place for me to move and I have to move the Kingfisher, and I have to move it into red, then my opponent would win the game. And that is a brief uh, explanation of kind of how to win, how the pieces move, and now we get to the actual like deep end that I gotta throw everybody into and, and, and hope that they can swim. So the board doesn't follow traditional chess layout. So chess has a very standard way that pieces are placed on it. Um, with this game, you actually have a play and reaction phase at the beginning before anything even happens on the table. So what that means is, is that say I was going and I wanted to start, I would place my, my fox here. And then my opponent could possibly put a snake here. And then I could put a stone here. And then my opponent could put a snake here. Um, as you can see, the board will eventually fill up where and um, where each player has a chance to put down and react to um, the other player's move. Now, the first player will always be reacted to by the opponent. However, the first player also gets to go first. So that's kind of the balance of the game. Um, I remember playing an example with a friend of mine and the first thing he said when he started the game was, I have control of the Kingfisher, and I hadn't even realized that he had put himself where I had no claim to the Kingfisher, and he had claim to all of it. 
So um, once all the pieces are on the table, the game proceeds. And the game I've played before with people and it kind of devolves into who's gonna take the most pieces. I've played with some people that their goal is from the get-go just to take all the pieces. They don't wanna do any strategy of trying to steal the Kingfisher. They just wanna win as efficiently as possible. Um, the only other rule that exists in the game um, is, well, there's two. So the first is, is that you can't move to a square with any piece and then move directly back to where you were on the next turn more than one time. So if you were to um, say we had these pieces here and I moved here and then you moved here and then I moved here and you moved here, this is actually not allowed. So you can't, you can't like do a cycle of moves that result in the same location after each player moves. So the moves have to be congruent. Like you have to keep moving. So if this happens, this happens. And I move here, this piece can't move back to here, but it can move to any square else. Or any other piece can move, it doesn't matter. So that's the first rule. And the second rule that you have to pay attention to is the rule of attrition. So what attrition means is, is if you have control of the Kingfisher, but you can't see an available move on the table uh, where the Kingfisher can move safely or any of your other pieces will be safe, um, you can option to not move. But if you choose to not move, then one of your tokens uh, has to be sacrificed. So you have to give up one of your pieces to pass your turn uh, if you have control of the Kingfisher. So that's an overall view. I'm not gonna actually be able to play this game like I did with Snakes and Foxes, but I can kind of show you how the board would lay out. So for instance, I'll just kind of throw some pieces on here so you can kind of see how it goes. Um, players would move, you know, I'm, I'm honestly just putting pieces on the board, so don't read into any strategies here. There is none, um, but players would move after all the pieces hit the table. So let me just get a few more on here. And you can kind of see um, where all the strategies and stuff could be played out. So they could put it in any zone. Like you can put your pieces in any territory. There's no rhyme or reason to where the pieces have to end up. Um, you can just throw things anywhere provided that there's a free space there. But you also would be considering where each piece would end up and how each person would react to the table being set this way. So again, I hope that I actually put that there. Um, I'm actually trying to develop a strategy while I put pieces down. Cause again, your opponent is able to do like cause and effect, but you also are able to respond. So there's a lot of actual technical strategy to this game that gets really cool when you kind of delve into it. I actually have yet to win this game um, because other people just kind of see through and I'm not much of a chess player to be honest. I do play chess, but I'm not a, a huge proponent of it. Like I don't, I don't see strategies, you know, three moves ahead and all that. But you can see where the board does seem to look a little bit cluttered. But everything kind of just goes once the board is established and everybody's allowed to start looking at where their pieces are going to end up. So I will continue real quick and hopefully. Uh, see, this player would probably notice that I'm trying to surround him all the way, but this is kind of blocking that. So they would put a piece there, and then I could put a piece here, and so on and so forth. So again, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm not going to put every single piece on the table, but what this is illustrating for you is just kind of how the table lays out, how the players respond, and what you're supposed to do, because this to me was by far and away the coolest aspect of the game, was just the idea of a chessboard that gets set up based on where people want to put pieces, not necessarily based on a preset thing that has to be established, you know, like this is doctrine, this is how we do. Um, I don't really like the, uh, the lack of creativity there. So this is really cool. And again, I believe this game is based on a Nordic game. Um, I forget what it's called, um, but it is, I think it's a Naftafel or Nifafel or something like that. I, I did look into that. And again, I will post in the um, in the video's description uh, the person who was talented enough to kind of try to decipher the overall rules to this game. 
but um, yeah, so this is how Sha Ra would lay out. And again, another game, another example of a game that um, everybody will have the chance to try once uh, once we get started with the um, channel and once we start actually getting people into the uh, tabletop um, tabletop simulator server and just to ask some people about their experience with Wheel of Time. I know this video ran a little bit longer. This game is a little more in, uh, skill intensive um, and I can understand if it's a little overwhelming, but sometimes you gotta just throw people in the deep end and let them see the brilliance that Jordan had when it came to just conceptualizing cool ideas and cool gameplay. And uh, hats off to anybody in the comments who can figure out who would win this particular round with this particular setup. I would love to read that, but um, I mean, it's a 50 shot. So we're never gonna know though, because that's the end of this video and have a good rest of the night.